Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin the last module which is summing up and discussion. In this module we are going to go through each and every lecture to summarize the salient points and to discuss their implications from a point of view of conservation. So in the first module we looked at three lectures the need for conservation, geography and conservation and biogeography. In the need for conservation we saw that conservation is derived from two word roots con and surveyor which means to keep together and we keep together nature and the natural environment and wildlife so it is the preservation protection and restoration of the natural environment and wildlife so that is conservation preservation protection and restoration all three of them of the natural environment and wildlife and we saw that it is different from things like preservation in preservation we allow some places and some creatures to exist without significant human interference that is in the case of preservation we let an area be in a natural form so we do not interfere with that area but in the case of conservation we can do active intervention we can interfere with the natural processes to ensure that the natural environment and the wildlife are conserved it is also different from environmentalism which is concerned about the impact of people on environmental quality so in the case of environmentalism the main focus is on the quality of environment now conservation is related to environmentalism because when you perform conservation you also get a good environmental quality through ecosystem services but the focus is different so both are related fields but they are different fields and it is also different from ecology which is the science of relationships between organisms and their environments now ecology or the knowledge of ecology of the principles of ecology play a very important role in doing conservation because when you want to keep together nature and wildlife you need to know what are their natural behaviors because that is going to help you so suppose you have a particular species that is going down in numbers and if you know through its ecology that it requires a particular kind of environment to lay its eggs then this knowledge can be used for conservation by providing that sort of a structure so that the organism is able to lay its eggs so ecology is very closely related with conservation but again both of these are different and we saw that the need for conservation arises because of human impacts on the environment especially in the current era of anthropocene we have put up so much of impact on the environment that the nature has become humanized and in a large number of cases because of the hippo factors we have done so much harm that if we do not take steps we are going to lose out the environment completely and these human impacts we saw were over consumption of resources destruction of habitat through things like habitat fragmentation or degradation or loss or displacement desertification ocean acidification which is a uh, an increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the oceans which is leading to an increased acidity lowering of ph depletion of ozone layer primarily because of chlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons changes in biogeochemical cycles such as nitrogen cycle through excessive use of fertilizers which is leading to eutrophication in a large number of water bodies loss of biodiversity extinction of biodiversity changes in distribution of organisms and in this case we saw changes in distribution because of climate change and changes in distribution because of the spread of invasive species 
we are observing changes in biodiversity we are observing soil erosion changes in geomorphology changes in stratigraphy changes in the elements in the atmosphere changes in soil because of things like water logging desertification build up of pesticides and other chemicals now because of all of that the soil is dying out the organisms in the soil are di dying out introductions in invasive species like lantana pollution including light pollution coral bleaching and wars so there are several human impacts on the environment and these human impacts have now made it imperative that we perform conservation if we wish to survive if we, we wish to exist as a species because human beings again are just one of the several species on this planet and we also need the natural environment for our existence so conservation has become important there is a need for conservation because we have already caused a huge amount of impact on the environment we observed that the quantum of human impacts on the environment is given by this equation i which is the impact is equal to p which is the population in the area multiplied by a which is the amount of affluence or the amount of richness in the area or the amount of resource usage in the area because when people have more money the average consumption goes up so more number of people consuming more resources and plus the technology being available because of which the extraction of the resources has become possible so basically if there is a very small primitive society with low number of people less number of people less amount of affluence so there are less number of people so less impact on the environment less affluence that is less consumption of resources so again the pressure on the resources is not that high and plus the technology is missing so people even if they wish to consume more they are unable to consume more so that is a primitive society but in the modern society we have increased our population like anything so we have a big population so too many people to feed too many people to clothe plus the affluence has gone up meaning that now each and every one of us is consuming more resources than our previous generations we are more resource consumptive society as compared to our grandparents because in our grandparents generation they did not have computers they did not have internet they did not have mobile communication they did not have all these appliances that require so much amount of energy in those days not everybody had a car so today society is much more affluent it is much more consumptive and plus we have the technology to extract the resources suppose we were a large group of people we had more aspirations more amount of affluence but we did not have the technologies so in that case we would not be able to mine as efficiently we would not be able to venture into other areas to gather the resources but today because all three of these have increased so the quantum of human impacts has become very high because of which we have a need for conservation in the next lecture geography and conservation we saw that geography it comes from the uh, greek word root geographia meaning the description of earth the term was coined by eratosthenes and it is the field of science concerning with the description of the earth and the processes and phenomena that are involved in forming the features of the earth that is we are asking what is there and why it is there basically we ask three questions what is there where is it and why is it where it is we can also say that geography is the study of aerial differentiation differentiation over an area variations in phenomena in different regions and the causal relationship between the variations and the areas involved now in this case we saw that in the current geological time period which is anthropocene geography has become different so anthropocene is a proposed epoch dating from the commencement of significant human impact on the earth's geology and ecosystems including but not limited to anthropogenic climate change so we saw that from the beginning of uh, the atomic era from the explosion of the trinity 
in 1945 we traditionally take this point as the beginning of anthropocene and in the anthropocene geography is the study of relationship between humanized nature because the nature has been altered if you look around you will find buildings everywhere you will find the impacts of human beings everywhere there are very few places left where you actually have a natural nature left in most of the areas you will find impacts of humans like cutting above trees or leveling of land or doing agriculture or making things like roads or buildings and so on so now we do not have a pure nature we have a humanized nature plus the human beings are also somewhat naturalized that is they have different tendencies they have different appearances they have different cultures in different areas so depending on the natural conditions we have the humanized uh, nature and naturalized human beings and geography in the anthropocene is the study of the relationship between humanized nature and naturalized human beings and in geography the studies are of three things what patterns in features that is natural features or cultural features are found in different regions of the earth that is we are looking at the spatial organization where are certain features located on the earth in this case we are looking at spatial integration and why are these features formed in the places where they are formed that is you can ask the question say in a particular country such as india what are the features found in different areas where are a particular sort of features found so where are the hills found where are the plateaus found where are the plains found and why are they found where they are found so these are the three questions that we ask in geography we observe that geography is closely related with several other disciplines primarily because different disciplines may have things that vary over different areas and if there is anything in a discipline that varies over an area we can study that portion in geography and so we saw that if we talk about the discipline of botany we have phytogeography which is the geography of the plants similarly for the discipline of zoology we have zoo geography geography of animals or geography of animal distribution in environmental science we have environmental geography for anthropology we have cultural geography and so on so geography is very closely related to several other disciplines it looks at any feature any phenomenon that varies over an area and there we can ask these three questions what is varying where is a particular feature found and why is it found where it is found and there are two approaches to study geography we have the systematic approach in which a phenomenon is studied world over as a whole and then identification of spatial patterns is done it was developed by the german geographer alexander von humboldt and the second approach is the regional approach in which we first of all divide the world into regions hierarchically and we study all the geographical phenomena in a particular region and this was developed by the german geographer karl ritter now based on the systematic approach we have several branches of geography we have physical geography we have human geography we have principles or philosophy of geography we have methods and techniques of geography and we have the interface branch which is biogeography in which case we have an interface between physical geography and human geography because in this case when we look at biogeography we have an impact of physical geography because different features make different habitats and different organisms are found in these different habitats so there is a very close relationship of the ideas of physical geography but at the same time in anthropocene we have such a huge amount of human impact that human geography also plays a big role in the studies of biogeography in the regional approach we have branches like regional studies 
in which case we can do a study of large size regions or medium size regions or small size regions. We can look at regional development, regional analysis and regional planning. And this regional planning can be country or rural planning or town or urban planning. Now, the relationship between geography and conservation is very intense because in geography we can ask the questions about conservation about what are the issues of conservation. So different issues of conservation like loss of biodiversity, loss of habitats, species getting endangered or extinct, pollution, overuse of resources. Now all of these issues can be studied from the lens of geography because we can ask where are these issues located. So for each and every of these issues we can ask where are they located. Are they found in the same concentration everywhere on the world or there are specific locations where they are localized or concentrated. Because if they are concentrated in certain locations, then it becomes easier to solve these issues. Now, we can find that they are mostly concentrated near human habitations, near roadways, near industries and so on. Now, in that case, we can ask the question, why are they found where they are found? And we can look at the causal relationships, such as the hippo factors, the loss of habitat, invasive species, pollution, human overpopulation and overharvesting of resources. So we can look at causal relationships. And once we understand the causal relationships which are causing a particular issue to be concentrated in a particular area, then in that area we can tackle that causal relationship to solve the issue of conservation. Such as we can ask the question how can these issues be solved? One answer is by creation of protected areas. So certain areas need to be protected for the conservation of biodiversity, wildlife and the natural environment. But then we will have the question where should we form these protected areas and there again we will have a rule of geography to select the best suited areas where we can do the maximum amount of conservation with little amount of resources that we have for conservation. And so geography is very intimately related with the topics of conservation. Now in the next lecture we had a look at biogeography which is the study of the geographical distribution of life on earth and the reasons for the patterns one observes on different continents, islands and oceans. That is in biogeography we are studying the aerial differentiation, the aerial integration of various phenomena that are related to living beings. How is life distributed on this planet? That is the main crux of biogeography. So what are the patterns in the distribution of life that are found in this, on this planet? Where are a particular form of life found? So for example, where are tigers found or where are polar bears found or where is the giant panda found? And why are they found where they are found? Why do we find tigers in specific locations and not everywhere else? So these are the questions that we ask in biogeography. And a closely related concept is that of the range. So range or dis the distribution of a species is the geographical area within which that species can be found. So when we say that polar bears are found in cold polar areas, uh, in other words, we can say that the range of polar bears is in the cold polar areas. So that is just another way of saying what is the distribution of a particular species. Now it is important because distribution of species like polar bears is limited and we can ask the question why is it limited and in this context geography plays an important role because things such as climate play a very important role in localization of species. So for example, if you look at altitudinal zonation, at any location if you go up we find different kinds of habitats, different kinds of organisms living there. Near the equator we will find the tropical forests. If you move up say on a mountain we will find subtropical forest followed by warm temperate, then cool temperate, then subarctic and arctic forests. Now in this case 
because of a lapse rate because temperature goes down as we move up we are finding that there are different climates resulting in different habitats which are in turn resulting in different species that are found in those locations and so when we say that the range or distribution of species is limited it is limited because of the climatic factors which in turn are governed by geographical factors now in this context if we take a location at the sea level and we start moving towards the poles here again we will find the same thing with the increase in latitude that is with movement towards the poles we shift from tropical forest to subtropical to warm temperate to cool temperate followed by subarctic and arctic now this is telling us that the species are being governed primarily because of the climate of that area because there are certain things in that climate that make it suitable for certain species but not for others and in this context we can have a look at the pull factors and the push factors pull factors are those conditions that attract organisms towards them such as availability of food or an amiable climate now this amiable climate is dependent on the kinds of adaptations that the species has or the adaptations that the organisms have because the organisms have evolved in a particular milieu of climate and so they will have those adaptations that make them best suited for that particular climate and so that becomes the amiable climate for these different organisms so if you have a good amount of food good amount of water good amount of shade or shelter if you have good conditions it is not very hot for the organism it is not very cold it is not very wet and so on then these are pull factors they attract organisms towards them and they play a role in the concentration of organisms in that particular area the opposite factors are the push factors that drive the organisms away from them such as scarcity of food so if there is a drought then animals will start to move away from that area if the climate becomes inhospitable say in the case of global warming if an area becomes too hot then the animals will start to move away now this movement can be a literal movement or a figurative movement so a literal movement is when the organisms that can move the organisms that have legs the organisms that have um wings they will actually move from one area to another area but in the case of those organisms that are fixed like plants we will see an apparent movement of the organisms because in the areas that are, have become inhospitable the species will die out and in those areas which are now more hospitable the dispersed organisms will be able to thrive in those areas and so slowly we will observe that the range of the species has actually shifted even though individual organisms have not shifted so that is the push and the pull factors and we saw that if we consider any organism that is found in a particular area the the reason why it is found can be several the species can be absent because an area is inaccessible because the the organisms have not dispersed to that area that can be one reason so for example we have certain species in south america and we can have a very similar climate and a very similar other conditions in india but those species are found in south america but not in india because those species have not yet moved to india if we were able to bring them to india through natural dispersion or through artificial dispersion if we just take some of those animals and put them in a ship bring them to india then they will be able to survive and thrive in india so dispersal can be one reason why the range of a particular species is limited if not because of dispersal it can be because of habitat selection there can be behavioral factors certain organisms prefer certain habitats and not others so even if a bird can make its nest on two different species of trees it is possible that it species and does not prefer the other species even though both the species provide it with uh, with the same amount of protection the same amount of cover 
but still there may be a behavioral preference if not the species can be absent because of other species we can have things like predation or parasitism or competition or disease if not any of these then the species can be absent because of physical and chemical factors like physical factors including light temperature soil structure fire currents and so on and chemical factors like water oxygen salinity ph soil nutrients and so on now in the second module we looked at the earth and the first lecture here was the origin and evolution of the earth in this case we saw that our current understanding is that the universe is expanding which means that earlier it should have been of a smaller size which hints to a theory of origin of the universe so we saw that the observations of hubble and others told us that the universe is expanding now if the universe is expanding today then in some point of time it should have been of a smaller size if you go back even further it should have been of an even more smaller size and so there should be a point where all of the matter and energy in the universe it can be concentrated to just one point and that points to the origin of the universe so in the beginning the universe was a tiny point which exploded 13.7 billion years before present and the expansion continues till date now because of this expansion we saw that the matter starts to form as energy gets converted into matter through this equation e is equal to mc square next we saw that the galaxies started to form because of accumulation of gas in the form of cloud like nebula and clumps of gases became denser with time and resulted in the formation of stars around 5 to 6 billion years ago so the stars are much more recent than the universe in the stars the nuclear reactions released energy and formed new elements so in this case we are now observing how new elements got formed because of nuclear reactions and we saw that the stars are not fixed they have have a life cycle so for example we can uh, observe that a star forming nebula will uh, form a protostar then a mid sized star then a red giant then a planetary nebula followed by a white dwarf and a black dwarf or if the stars are more massive then the protostar can form the massive star followed by red super giant followed by a supernova explosion that can result in either a neutron star or a black hole or it can release matters again for the nebula or we can have the cycle where the there is a red dwarf that gets formed converting into blue dwarf into a white dwarf into a black dwarf again so the stars have a life cycle now our solar system was formed around 5 billion years ago the sun was formed around 5 billion years ago and the planets were formed around 4.6 billion years ago there are four terrestrial or rocky or inner planets which are mercury venus earth and mars and there are four jovian or gas giant or outer planets which are jupiter saturn uranus and neptune so we have total eight planets the terrestrial planets were formed near the sun where the high temperatures did not permit gases to condense and the solar wind blew away most of the gas that was formed and thus these are smaller rocky and denser planets whereas jovian planets are large gaseous and with less density so they are gaseous planets and because they are gaseous so they have a less density and because they are gaseous they are very large in size now these were formed away from the sun in those conditions where the solar winds were not blowing away the gases away and in those conditions where the temperatures were low enough to permit the gases to form the planets the earth began as a hot and molten mass continuously being bombarded by planetesimals and other celestial bodies it got heated because of gravitational compression radioactive decay and impacts with asteroids and other planetesimals so it got heated and then because of gravity there was a differentiation of materials the heavier metals like iron zinc 
uh, or sank towards the center and the lighter elements came to the surface and so today we have an earth where the core is much more denser it has many more amounts of uh, heavy metals as compared to the crust so the crust is lighter so with cooling an outer crust got formed and we got a differentiated layered structure of the earth so this is the layered structure we have the crust followed by a mantle followed by the core now if you talk about the earth's atmosphere the first stage was a primordial atmosphere that was comprised chiefly of hydrogen and helium gases it got lost because of the solar winds then in the second stage we had degassing of the solar of the solid earth which created an atmosphere of water nitrogen carbon dioxide methane ammonia and very little of free oxygen and then later on we had the evolution of plants which led to photosynthesis and it led to a flooding of the uh, atmosphere with oxygen so the amounts of carbon dioxide went down which led to a gradual cooling of the planet because less amount of greenhouse gases remained on the planet now this fact is very important for conservation because if we go on increasing the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere then it is not that the earth is a static thing it can again go back to those primordial conditions if we go on destroying biodiversity if we go on increasing the greenhouse gases concentration we will move the earth back to the earlier stages where you have less number of organisms where you have very little amount of biodiversity and an atmosphere that is rich in carbon dioxide now the point is that once you increase the amount of carbon dioxide beyond a certain limit then there is no moving back because with the increase in temperature you will have a situation where a large number of plants would die off and all of their bodies will again go on releasing carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere there will be less amount of photosynthesis at the same time with the melting of the glaciers you will have a situation where the currently the the glaciers are reflecting back the sun's heat but in those conditions the planet will warm towards the poles as well we will have a shutdown of the uh, global conveyor belt and once that shuts down we will again have a situation where the climates would change a lot resulting in a much greater amount of destruction of biodiversity so basically the earth is not a static thing it's a dynamic thing and the earth has reached the present form through several millions of years of evolution and in the anthropocene we have this possibility that we can uh, wipe down all of these millions of years of evolution and bring the earth back to an uh, earlier state then we looked at the geological time scale where the time is divided into era period and epoch and we saw that uh, in the beginning we had the big bang the origin of stars followed by these eons hadean archean proterozoic zoic and the phanerozoic now the current eon is phanerozoic in which we have these three eras paleozoic mesozoic and cenozoic the current era is the cenozoic era which is divided into tertiary and quaternary periods and the quaternary period is divided into pleistocene holocene and now anthropocene now in this case we saw that we get information about the older time periods through principles of relative dating and absolute dating in relative dating we have the principles of superposition which means that in an undisturbed sedimentary strata the bottom layers are older than the layers above them we have the principle of original horizontality meaning that the layers of rocks get deposited from above and in that case they are originally laid down horizontally they are continuous in a lateral direction if we have um, a deformation that cuts across the rocks then that deformation should be younger than the rocks that is the rocks should be older than those deformations so if you have a rock that has been twisted then the rock formed first then the twist came 
we have the principle of inclusions if there are inclusions then they are older than the host rock and we have the principle of fossil succession which says that the assemblage of fossils are unique to the time that they lived in and so they can be used to age rocks across a wide geographic distribution in absolute dating we make use of things like radioisotope dating which depends on the half life of uh, various radioisotopes we can make use of thermoluminescence or we can use fission track dating so we have different techniques that are available with us to date different uh, things that are found on the earth and using them we can build up a history of the earth we can now analyze what was there before we humans even came on this planet now in the next lecture we looked at the structure of the earth and in this case we saw that there are two sources of information we have direct sources where we directly get the information say through drilling or through volcanic eruptions now in drilling we get the information that as we go down the temperature and density increase through volcanic eruptions we get a composition of what is there in the interior so we can now know what are the elements that are there in the inside of the planet or we can have indirect sources such as modeling or structures of meteors and other celestial bodies that were formed in a similar time period as the earth we can look at changes in gravity or gravity anomalies we can have magnetic surveys or we can look at seismic activity and earthquakes now in the case of the indirect information one of the most important pieces is given by the earthquake waves and we saw that the earthquake waves can be divided into body waves and surface waves the body waves are generated at the focus travel through the body of the earth in all directions so they are body waves and they are of two kinds we have the p waves or the primary waves and the s waves or the secondary or shear waves now primary waves are fast they are first to reach the surface they are longitudinal in nature and they can move through solid liquid and gas whereas shear waves are transverse in nature they displace the ground perpendicular to the direction of propagation and they can only move through uh, solids because fluids do not support shear stresses and when these body waves come to the surface then waves are created by the interaction of the body waves with the surface rocks resulting in surface waves which move along the surface of the earth and they are slower than body waves and they diminish with distance so if we plotted the amplitude versus time the first waves will be the p waves followed by s waves followed by the surface waves and because these waves have different properties they create shadow zones so shadow zones of earthquake waves are the areas where the earthquake waves do not get reported and we saw that there is a p wave shadow zone which uh, lies in the area from angular distances of 103 degrees to 142 degrees where p waves are not reported now this results from the p waves getting refracted by the liquid core now p waves can move through the liquid core but they will suffer refraction just as we find the refraction of light s waves also form a shadow zone which is much greater it is from 103 degrees to 180 degrees now this results because the s waves are stopped by the liquid core because they cannot move through liquids now the lack of s waves and the large slowing of p waves by around 40% has helped us to deduce that the outer core is made out of liquid and it also has helped us in defining the diameter of the core so this is what the shadow zones look like the p wave shadow zone is this much so you will get the p waves here and you will get the p waves here but the s wave shadow zone is a very large area now in the case of s wave shadow zone there is no wave that is moving through the outer core whereas in the case of the p wave shadows they are resulting because the waves are able to move through the outer core but they are getting refracted and so through all of these information we have the current understanding of the structure of the earth 
that the oceanic crust is the top 5 kilometers with a density of 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter. The continental crust is the top 30 kilometers with a density of lesser that is 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. So both of these form the crust. Then we have the mantle from the Mohorovic discontinuity to around 2900 kilometers. The density is greater than the crust. It is around 3.4 gram per cubic centimeter. Above 400 kilometer portion is called the asthenosphere, which is the weak sphere and is the main source of magma. And the crust and the uppermost mantle form the lithosphere with a thickness of 10 to 300 kilometers. And beneath the mantle we have the core and the core is divided into the liquid core or the outer core and the solid inner core. So core is from 2900 kilometers in depth to 6400 kilometers which is the radius of the earth. The outer core has a density of 5 gram per cubic centimeter and the inner core has a density of 13 gram per cubic centimeter. And to arrive at this understanding, we, we have made use of several direct sources, several indirect sources and lots of modeling to help corroborate all of these different in pieces of information. So this is the current understanding of the structure of the earth. In the next lecture, we looked at the features on the earth. And if you look at the earth, there are certain portions that have land and there are vast portions that have the water bodies. So the continents cover 29% of the earth's surface, the oceans cover 71% of the earth's surface. Now in the features we can ask the question why are the continents and the oceans where they are. And in this case we looked at the continental drift theory which states that the continents are drifting. And uh, the main theory is Alfred Wegener's continental drift theory proposed in 1912 which states that earlier all the continents were joined together in a super common continent called the Pangaea, which was surrounded by a mega ocean, which is Panthalassa. And around 200 million years ago, the Pangaea began to split. It split into Laurasia or the Northern continent and Gondwana land or the Southern continent, which have since continued to split and give rise to the present configuration of continents and oceans. So this is the, brief of continental drift theory earlier you had Pangaea and Panthalassa and then it split to form Laurasia and Gondwana land which have continued the split and the continents have been moving and this is the current configuration. There are several evidences for continental drift theory such as the matching of the continents or the jigsaw fit that is if you look at this portion in South America and if you look at this portion in Africa we can actually move South America and the map will very closely match here. So there is a jigsaw fit and it is even more apparent at, hundred, uh, at 1000 fathom line in the ocean that is below the oceans. Rocks of the same age are found across oceans. So the bed of ancient rocks the, that is 2 billion years old on the Brazilian coast it matches that from Western Africa. We find marine deposits and the earliest marine deposits along the coastline of South America and Africa are of Jurassic age. So even the marine deposits have a matching age. Tillites which are sedimentary rocks from glacial deposits of similar origin have been found in India, Africa, Falkland Islands, Madagascar, Antarctica and Australia. Gold placer deposits are found in Ghana without the source rocks and the source rocks are there in Brazil. We find a distribution of fossils, so Lemur fossils in India, Madagascar and Africa, which currently are so far apart. Mesosaurus fossils in South Africa and Brazil, which are so far apart, they are 4800 kilometers apart. But if we have the same uh, fossils that are found in different areas, it means that earlier the organisms would have been found in all of these areas. Now. It is not possible for these organisms to cross the oceans and move to the other locations. So the only thing that remains is that earlier there should have been a, a connection between both or all of these areas, which means that earlier these areas should have been joined together. So we looked at the location evidence, we have the fossil evidence, 
but then wegner was not able to uh, elucidate what was the force that was leading to this continental drift so he proposed that it could be because of tidal forces or because of pole fleeing force due to the rotation of the earth but both of these are very small and even over millions of years they cannot explain the large sized uh, displacement of continents then later on arthur holmes proposed that the convectional currents in the earth's mantle because of thermal differences could have resulted in the drift but currently uh, we have new evidences that have helped us to reconcile all of these facts now we know the configuration of the ocean floor we know the distribution of earthquakes and volcanoes we know the magnetic reversal strips on the ocean floor similar composition and age of rocks on both sides of mid ocean ridges we know that the oceanic crust is much younger than the continental crust the sediments on the ocean floor are thin and young and that the earthquakes in mid oceanic ridges are of shallow depth and especially the analysis of the mid oceanic ridges has helped us to understand the forces that are happening so we have looked at the distribution of earthquakes and this distribution moves along certain lines and these lines are what differentiate different tectonic plates the distribution of volcanoes is also very similar we find a linear arrangement of these volcanoes uh, we have looked at the magnetic reversal strips so when the magma is coming out when the lava is getting formed on the surface then it freezes the direction and the strength of magnetism that is present at that point of time and we find that on both the sides of the uh, uh ridges we uh, find that the magnetic uh, strips are very similar similarly the chemical composition and age of rocks is also very symmetric in both the directions we have looked at sea floor spreading theory of hess and because of all of these we can now synthesize our plate tectonic theory it was given by mckenzie parker and morgan in 1967 and it stated that tectonic plates are lithospheric plates which are massive irregularly shaped slabs of solid rock generally comprised of both continental and oceanic lithosphere so it is not that the continents are moving above the oceanic crust but it is that both of these are moving together in the form of tectonic plates and these plates move over asthenosphere as rigid units often horizontally the movement is associated with young fold mountains or ridges or trenches or faults and volcanoes and the slow movement of hot softened semi solid and liquid mantle below the plates due to the creation of convection cells drives the movement of these plates and so the plates move not the continents and we saw that the plates are divided into several major plates and minor plates and this boundary between these plates has a very close correlation with things like earthquakes and volcanoes the boundaries are of three kinds we have divergent boundaries where we have the spreading sites we have convergent boundaries where we have subduction zones and we have transform boundaries now in the next module module 3 we looked at lithosphere and landforms and in the first lecture we had a look at rocks and minerals and we stated that rocks are aggregates of one or more minerals they do not have a definite composition of mineral constituents so the composition may vary which makes it different from a mineral because a mineral has a definite chemical composition so rocks are made out of minerals the rocks may not have a definite composition but each mineral that forms the rock has a definite composition so minerals are naturally occurring in organic solids with a definite chemical composition and an ordered atomic arrangement now this is in the context of the rocks but in the context of resources we also include things like petroleum or natural gas or coal in the category of minerals so that's a different story 
Minerals have several characteristics. They have a definite external crystal form. They form cleavages, which is the tendency to break in given directions, producing relatively plain surfaces. They can undergo fracture, which is not along the cleavage planes. They have luster, which is appearance without regards to color, such as metallic luster or silky or glassy or waxy. They have definite colors. They have definite streaks, which is the color of the ground powder as seen on a streak plate. Different minerals have different transparency, structure, hardness and specific gravity. In the case of hardness, we saw that we have the Mohs scale of hardness where any mineral which is down can scratch all the minerals that are above it. And with this, we can uh, discern the hardness of different minerals. In the case of rocks, we saw that there are three families of rocks, igneous rocks, which are formed out of hot molten magma. We have sedimentary rocks that are formed because of the sediments through which are formed through weathering and erosion and then they are deposited in different locations and we have the metamorphic rocks which are formed because of the action of heat and pressure on igneous and sedimentary rocks and these rocks move through the rock cycle so they are not fixed but an igneous rock can uh, form a metamorphic rock or it can uh, be weathered to form sediments which will then form a sedimentary rock the metamorphic and sedimentary rocks can form magma if they move down, if they are heated and then this magma can result in an igneous rock. And the metamorphic rock can uh, form sediments and it can result in a sedimentary rock. So we have all different kinds of movements between these different rock families. In the next lecture, we looked at geomorphology and processes. So geomorphology, geo is land, morph is form and logos is study. So this is the study of Earth's form. And in this case, we looked at the endogenic, endo is inside. So the forces that are generated from inside or the internal forces. And we looked at exogenic forces, which are external forces. The internal forces are mainly land forming forces and the external forces are mainly land wearing forces and they determine why the surface of the earth is uneven and we looked at different geomorphic processes now in the case of endogenic processes we looked at diastrophism which is deformation of the earth's crust especially folding and faulting now it may result in the formation of mountains formation of continents or earthquakes or plate tectonics then another endogenic process is volcanism. Uh, in the case of exogenic processes, we have things like weathering, mass movement, erosion, transportation and deposition. And we have different geomorphic agents, which are these agents of exogenic processes like wind, water, ice and so on. Now we looked at weathering, in which case the rocks are broken up into smaller fragments. And weathering is of three kinds. We have physical weathering, we have chemical weathering, and we have biological weathering. Mass movement is the movement of mass of rock and debris down the slopes by the action of gravity. And we saw that uh, weathering is not a prerequisite, but it helps. And mass movement is favored by weak and unconsolidated materials, vertical cliffs and steep slopes, abundant precipitation and torrential rains, scarcity of vegetation, removal of vegetation, removal of support from below, overloading through addition of materials, earthquakes, explosions, vibrations of machinery and so on. Now through all of these processes, through the endogenic and exogenic processes, we have different landforms that now exist on this planet. And these different landforms are supporting different organisms, different biodiversity. And so the landforms play a very important role in the biodiversity of this planet. So understanding them becomes very important for conservation. So we looked at erosion, which is the application of kinetic energy associated with an agent to the surface of land along with it moves. And uh, this is a degrading process 
and we saw that there are several agents of erosion which may be controlled by climate or not controlled by climate and transportation and deposition are consequences of erosion and they aid the process of aggradation next uh, we looked at the evolution of landforms and we looked at relief which is the difference between two elevation points on the surface of the earth so if the surface is flat we say that the area has a low relief if the surface is undulating then we say that the area has a high relief and landform is a natural or artificial feature of the solid surface of the earth and each landform has a beginning and a history that is shaped by geomorphic processes and agents now in this case these agents are called as geomorphic agents which are things like running water ground water glaciers waves and currents and wind now in the case of running water we saw that there are several erosional landforms that are formed like valleys waterfalls plunge pools and river terraces and there can also be several depositional landforms like alluvial fans deltas oxbow lakes due to meanders flood plains and natural levees so in each of these geomorphic agents we will find that there are certain erosional landforms that are formed and certain depositional landforms that are formed now all of these agents are trying to lower the relief of the earth that is they are trying to wear down the high areas and they are trying to deposit materials in the low lying areas so these geomorphic agents try to lower the relief of the earth in the case of groundwater we saw that we have erosional landforms like sinkholes we have things like uvalas we have lepees and we have the caves and depositional landforms include things like stalactites stalagmites and pillars we looked at uh, glaciers where we have erosional landforms like cirques we have ridges or the arêtes we have horns and we have the hanging valleys and the depositional landforms include things like glacial till deposits outwash deposits eskers and drumlins similarly in the case of waves and currents we have erosional landforms like cliffs terraces caves and stacks and depositional landforms like beaches offshore sandbars spits in the case of wind we have erosional landforms like pediments pedi plains playas deflation hollows and caves mushroom table and pedestal rocks but then these same geomorphic agent wind also results in depositional landforms like sand dunes so all of these geomorphic agents are the agents of erosion and they are the agents of transportation and deposition and they try to lower the relief but in this process they create several different landforms now because these landforms have different properties so they are inhabited by different organisms so these landforms become very important from the point of view of biogeography from the point of view of distribution of organisms and so understanding them becomes very important for the cause of conservation so that's all for today we will continue our discussion in the next lecture thank you for your attention jai hind